Today I'm going to be reading from Transformation of the God Image in Jung's Red Book, Foundations for a New Psychology of Religion by Dr. Ingrid Rydell. Jung's Religious Mission, the God Image and its Transformation, along with the topic of religion in general, together combine one of the major themes of the Red Book. This runs like a red thread through the entire book. Sono Shamdasani, in his introduction, notes a passage where Jung reports receiving instructions regarding his vocation in a conversation with Soul on January 5th, 1922. I, but what is my calling? Soul, the new religion and its proclamation. I, oh God, how should I do this? Soul, do not be such of little faith. No one knows it as you do. There is no one who could say it as well as you could. End quote. Reading these sentences, one is involuntarily taken aback, and so was Jung when he heard what soul was demanding. But you are not thinking that I should publish what I have written. That would be a misfortune, and who would understand it? Despite Jung's confusion, this is exactly what his soul pointedly demands, namely to bring his experiences to a public audience and to explain his encounter with his psyche. And though he meticulously worked on this self-experiment from 1913 onward, while also wrestling with a new God image, and created his Red Book with its beautiful images, he decided not to publish this work during his lifetime. Since, who would understand it? Only 50 years after Jung's death was it finally decided to publish this impressive book that laid the foundations for his entire life work. The Red Book is not at all a scientific opus. On the contrary, this book compiles Jung's psychic experiences during his times of personal upheaval and crisis. The inner turmoil after the break with Freud and the outer events of World War I brought with them a constant stream of inner images and thoughts and forced Jung to search for new solutions to overcome the contemporary malaise of spiritual alienation. It is especially Jung's wrestling with the traditional Christian God image and his attempt to transform this outdated image that we today can relate to when we, in our own lives, encounter crises in which the God image our culture has handed down to us does not suffice and leaves us in a spiritual void. To no longer be a Christian is easy, Soul says to Jung, but what next? Jung personally endured his psychic ordeal as his traditional God image started to crumble. After his break with Freud, for whom religion was an illusion, Jung, the son of a Protestant clergyman, started to reassess the importance of a religious attitude. His publication in 1912 of Symbols of Transformation postulated a much broader concept of psychic libido than Freud's, a concept that would also embrace mythology and religious phenomena. The relationship between the psyche and religion, i.e. the psychology of religion, would increasingly become Jung's main interest in the course of his work on the Red Book. But as Shamdasani cautiously notes, quote, he, Jung, attempted to develop a psychology of the religion-making process. Rather than proclaiming a new prophetic revelation, his interest lay in the psychology of religious experiences. The task was to depict the translation and transposition of the numinous experience of individuals into symbols, and eventually into the dogmas and creeds of organized religions, and finally, to study the psychological functions of such symbols. For such a psychology of the religion-making process to succeed, it was essential that analytical psychology, while providing an affirmation of the religious attitude, 
did not succumb to becoming a creed, unquote. A selection of certain of Jung's statements regarding religion from the Red Book can even today lead to misunderstandings if they are not seen in the context of the whole process of his inner experiences and his findings. At the time of working on his Red Book, Jung was deeply influenced by Nietzsche's Zarathustra and the announcement of the death of God. The pathetic language of Zarathustra as well as the ceremonies and ancient tome of the Bible both determine Jung's style of language in the Red Book. They lead to a prophetic ductus in his writings. What is new in comparison to Nietzsche is that Jung's emphasis on the psyche as the dwelling place of the numinous. The soul becomes the realm for a new birth of God, just as Meister Eckhart had envisioned as well as the Gnostics, for whom God is born in the soul, a God that can embrace the complexio oppositorum. Jung calls this God Abraxas. First and foremost, Jung wanted to fundamentally change the Judeo-Christian God image so that it could account for aspects that in the course of history had been excluded, namely matter, the feminine, and evil. This new God image was necessary due to experiences humans clearly encounter in their dealings with the numinous, experiences that cannot be compared to experiences with the outer objects of the world since they are highly subjective. The gods a fantasy, and in this text, the word fantasy is spelled P-H-A-N-T-A-S-Y. How Western man has lost his gods because of a worldview based entirely upon rational, scientific thinking and is also unable to find them in the religions of the East is shown in Jung's encounter with Isdabar, the Sumerian bull god, image 36 in the Red Book. I quote the text of Jung's act of imagination from January 8, 1914, in which he meets Isdabar. Quote, But on the third night, a desolate mountain range blocks my way, though a narrow valley gorge allows me to enter. The way leads inevitably between two high rock faces, my feet are bare and injure themselves on the jagged rocks. Here the path becomes slippery. One half of the way is white, the other black. I step onto the black side and recoil, horrified. It is iron. I step onto the white half. It is ice. But so it must be. I dart across and onward, and finally the valley widens into a mighty rocky basin. A narrow path winds up along vertical rocks to the mountain ridge at the top. As I approach the top, a mighty booming resounds from the other side of the mountain, like ore being pounded. The sound gradually swells and echoes thunderously in the mountain. As I reach the pass, I see an enormous man approach from the other side. Two bullhorns rise from his great head, and a rattling suit of armor covers his chest. His black beard is ruffled and decked with exquisite stones. The giant is carrying a sparkling double axe in his hands, like those to strike bulls. Before I can recover from my amazed fright, the giant is standing before me. I look at his face. It is faint and pale and deeply wrinkled. His almond-shaped eyes look at me, astonished." Unquote. Image 36 of the Red Book shows the huge giant, Isdabar, standing in front of a blue background filled with winged snakes. At the bottom of this image kneels a tiny human figure surrounded by crocodiles. At the bottom of this figure kneels a tiny human figure surrounded by crocodiles to the left and right side. This is Jung's eye, who now addresses the giant. Quote, 
I, O Isdabar, most powerful, spare my life and forgive me for lying like a worm in your path. Isdabar, I do not want your life. Where do you come from? I, I come from the West. Isdabar, you come from the West? Do you know the Western lands? Is this the right way to the Western lands? I, I come from a Western land whose coasts wash against the great Western Sea. Isdabar, does the sun sink in that sea or does it touch the solid land in its decline? I, the sun sinks far beyond the sea. Isdabar, beyond the sea? What lies there? I, there is nothing but empty space there. And as you know, the earth is round, and moreover, it turns around the sun. Isdabar, damned one, where do you get such knowledge? So there is no immortal land where the sun goes down to be reborn? Are you speaking the truth? His eyes flicker with fury and fear. He steps a thundering pace closer. I tremble. Unquote. When Jung's eye continues to talk about the sun as a celestial body that lies unspeakably far out in the unending space, Isdabar is seized by suffocating fear. To become immortal and to reach his sun is his deep desire, which now is shown to be impossible. In despair, Isdabar smashes his axe on a rock with a powerful, clanging blow. Here, a massive conflict between the scientific and the mythological worldview appears. Who of us has not experienced this conflict himself when the scientific mode of thought has collided with the faith given us in our childhood? The belief in a God who would take care of us and guide us. Isdabar, the giant, now collapses and sobs like a child. He lay stretched out on the ground, paralyzed by the poison of science. Quote, Isdabar, you call poison truth? Is poison truth or is truth poison? Do not our astrologers and priests also speak of truth? And yet theirs does not act like poison. Isdabar, are there then two sorts of truths? I, it seems to me to be so. Our truth is that what comes to us from the knowledge of outer things, the truth of your priests, is that which comes to you from the inner things. Isdabar hath sitting up. That was a salutary word. After Jung's eye collects some wood and lights a fire, he and Isdabar continue their conversation while sitting in front of the flickering flames. Isdabar, have you no gods anymore? I, no, words are all we have. Isdabar, but are these words powerful? I, so they claim, but one notices nothing of this. Isdabar, we do not see the gods either, and yet we believe they exist. We recognize their workings in natural events. I, Science has taken from us the capacity of belief. Isdabar, what? You have lost that too? How then do you live? Jung's eye now stays with Isdabar during the long cold night, since he senses that Isdabar needs him. And yet again, I feel it quite clearly that my life would have broken in half had I failed to heal my God. This sentence leads to the fundamental questions that force Jung into a crisis. How can we live without the gods, without symbols for the divine realm that transcends us, encompasses, and saves us? Jung's life is at risk to break apart if he should lose his god forever. So, during the long night at the fire at which Jung's eye and Istbar warm each other without finding a way out of their dilemma, Jung's eye finally says, my heart bleeds at the thought of leaving you here without having done the utmost to help you.
Upmost here is spelled U-P-M-O-S-T. What is the utmost that Jung's eye can envision to save his fallen God? It is the attempts to resurrect the God, a resurrection that is accomplished via an imaginative approach. What a brilliant and creative thought. However, some critical thoughts step in. Quote, what can be done? I am basically convinced that Isdabar is hardly real in the ordinary sense, but is a fantasy. He will, of course, not accept that he is a fantasy, but instead claim that he is completely real and that he only can be helped in a real way. Nevertheless, it would be worth trying this means once. I will appeal to him. End quote. And this is exactly what Jung's I does. I, my prince, powerful one, listen. A thought came to me that might save us. I think that you are not at all real, but only a fantasy. Isdabar, I am terrified by this thought. It is murderous. Do you even mean to declare me unreal? Now that you have lamed me so pitifully, I, perhaps I have not made myself clear enough and have spoken too much in the language of the Western lands. I do not mean to say that you are not real at all, of course, but only as real as a fantasy. If you could accept this, much would be gained. Isdabar, what would be gained by this? You are a tormenting devil. I, pitiful one. I will not torment you. The hand of the doctor does not seek to torment, even if it causes grief. Can you really not accept that you are a fantasy? Isdabar, woe betide me. In what magic do you want to entangle me? Should it help me if I take myself for a fantasy? I, you also know that one often gives the sick new names to heal them. For with a new name, they come by a new essence. Your name is your essence. Isdabar, you are right. Our priests also say this. I. So you are prepared to admit that you are a fantasy? Isdabar, if it helps, yes. What is Jung doing here? It is not really convincing that he compares the essence of this God with a fantasy. Only later does this become more convincing when he calls the god a symbol and then goes to great lengths to show what a symbol is and what its effectiveness is. Insofar as he relates the Imago Dei to a symbol, he relativizes its ontological objectivity, but not its effectiveness. The god image has the strongest influence not only within the human soul, but also in the collective consciousness of a culture. Even where it would be consciously suppressed, it continues to be most effective in the collective unconscious of a culture. However, Isdabar himself now seems to believe in his resurrection while being a fantasy. Though the situation remains very complex, he acknowledges Jung's attempt. Quote, Isdabar. That was a masterstroke. Where are you carrying me? I, I am going to carry you down into the Western lands, unquote. Jung comments on this while carrying Isdabar to a quiet, dark garden and a secluded house. Quote, this tangible and apparent world is one reality, but fantasy is the other reality. So long as we leave the God outside us apparent and tangible, he is unbearable and hopeless. But if we turn the God to a fantasy, he is in us and easy to bear." Unquote. How deeply the myth of Gilgamesh, i.e. Isdabar, is still rooted in the contemporary individuals I have witnessed in Good Friends of Mine who made that myth the symbolic background of their relationship. Another friend of mine, an artist, set up after the death of a beloved artist friend, a collection of images showing the lamentation of Gilgamesh after the death of Enkidu. 
Contemporary individuals who are acquainted with the myth of Gilgamesh are slightly baffled when they read the Red Book and find out that in his imagination, Jung squeezes Isdabar into an egg to get him into the door of the house. This seems not consistent, since a fantasy would be able to get through a door of any size. This inconsistency was also felt by Jung himself, when he later mentioned to Agnella Jaffe that some of the fantasies were driven by fear, such as the chapter on the devil and the chapter on Gilgamesh Isdabar. From one perspective, it was stupid that he, Jung, had to find a way to help the giant, but he felt that if he didn't do so, he would have failed. He paid for the ridiculous solution through realizing that he had captured a god. Many of these fantasies were a hellish combination of the sublime and the ridiculous. What needs to be taken very seriously, though, since it belongs to the treasure house of humanity, is the image of the transformation of a god into an egg. This is a widespread mythological motive that describes the beginning of a divine development, the new birth of a god. Incantations, songs for a new god. Is it not rather grandiose to transform a god into an egg and hide him away in one's own pocket? as if now some kind of enantiodromia sets in moving from grandiosity to a devoted hatching. Jung starts his incantations, quote, Thus do not speak and do not show the God, but sit in a solitary place and sing incantations in the ancient manner. Set the egg before you, the God in his beginning, and behold it and incubate it with the magical warmth of your gaze." Unquote. In the following incantations, Jung combines the Christian image of the birth of the divine child during Christmas with the Eastern Vedic hymns of an egg from which a god is born. Thus, he knits Eastern and Western traditions into his process of creating a new god image. In doing so, he created a series of images, images 50 to 64. In which festive colors, such as red and gold, dominate to celebrate Isdabar's incubation and resurrection. An impressive example of a renewal of God Jung starts his incantations as follows. And in parentheses, it says f image 50, so I'm going to give you image 50 here. Image 50. Quote, Christmas has come. The God is in the egg. I have prepared a rug for my God, an expensive rug, from the land of mourning. He shall be surrounded by the shimmer of magnificence of his eastern land. I am the mother, the simple maiden, who gave birth and did not know how. I am the careful father who protects the maiden. I am the shepherd who received the message as he guarded his herd at night in the dark fields." Unquote. Indeed, image 50 in the Red Book is similar to a deep red Eastern prayer rug with sacred motives worked into it. The god on the egg, representing a symbolic pregnancy, is shown as a golden egg positioned on a brown field in the lower part of the image. The field itself having a triangular shape as a symbol of the fertile feminine. Image 51, too, is similar with a beautiful prayer rug colored in red with green ribbon ornamentally worked in. In the upper section of the image, the wise man of the eastern land resides. The lower section again shows the egg. The right and the left side show eagle and snake that are both combined with the sun symbol. In the incantations of image 51, Jung identifies himself with the animals in the Christmas narrative. Quote, 
I am the holy animal that stood astonished and cannot grasp the becoming of the God. I am the wise man who came from the East, suspecting the miracle from afar." Unquote. After Jung emulates all the figures of the Christmas saga by creating an inner Christmas crib, he then says, and I am the egg that surrounds and nurtures the seed of the God in me. Here we find Meister Eckert's approach of a mystic Christianity pointing toward the birth of God within the soul, an approach that is also well known in Hinduism and Gnosticism. With the incantation of image 52, Jung starts to consider himself as someone who brings the God to life, like Maria, and therefore takes a feminine identity. Quote, the solemn hours lengthen, and my humanity is wretched and suffers torment. Since I am a giver of birth, whence do you delight me, O God? Unquote. Jung is becoming delighted, seized by the joy of ecstasy. He then describes the coming Godhead as a complexio oppositorum, which he later, in the third part of the Red Book, will give the name Abraxas. This leads to a God image that is beyond any rational comprehension. Quote, he is the eternal emptiness and the eternal fullness. Nothing resembles him and he resembles everything. Eternal darkness and eternal brightness, eternal below and eternal above, double nature in one simple in the manifold, meaning in absurdity, freedom in bondage, subjugated when victorious, old in youth, yes in no." Unquote. These incantations are positioned in the center of image 52, encircled by various types of motifs and ornaments, Important to emphasize are the four circles in blue, as well as half of a mandala-like structure at the bottom of the image, obviously symbolizing an awareness of growing wholeness. After the elevated spirit of this incantation, Jung's mood shockingly swings into the state of hubris when his eye states, nothing remains in the gods other than an egg, and I possess this egg. Unquote. After another enantiodromia in his emotions, he finally opens the egg with great awe. It seems as if in these incantations, one strong emotion produces a strong antithetical emotion. The opposites are hardly integrated in this phase of Jung's imaginations. Now, however, he can get on his knees. Quote, on the evening of the third day, I kneeled down on the rug and carefully opened the egg. Something resembling smoke rises up from it, and suddenly Isdabar is standing before me, enormous, transformed, and complete. It's as if he had awoken from a deep sleep. He says, where was I? I was completely sun, unquote. His desire for the sun and immortality has finally been fulfilled. In Sumerian mythology, Isdabar is associated with the sun god. The incubation and rebirth of Isdabar follows the classic pattern of solar myths. This is related to the setting and rising of the sun in the sea. We experience the rising and setting of the sun as a golden egg in the sea. Jung had a thorough and extensive knowledge of humanity's mythologies and knew that the figures appearing in his imaginations were rooted in this knowledge, that something was at work in what we today refer to as cultural memory. His imagination here ends with the following scene, quote, when I thought that I had caught the mighty one and held him in my cupped hands, he was the sun himself. Obviously, emphasizing the rising God, Jung continues in the following imagination. Quote, 
I wandered toward the east where the sun rises. I probably wanted to rise too, as if I were the sun and rise with it to daybreak. While he rises, however, I go down. When I conquered the god, his force streamed into me. But when the god rested in the egg and awaited his beginning, my force went into him. And when he rose up radiantly, I lay on my face. I lay there like a child bearer, cruelly mauled and bleeding her life into the child. I lay there like a child bearer, cruelly mauled and bleeding her life into the child. My God has torn me apart terribly. He had drunk the juice of my life. He had drunk my highest power into him and become marvelous and strong like the sun, an unblemished God who bore no stigma or flaw. He had taken my wings from me. He left me powerless and groaning." Unquote. What kind of strange either or does Jung here reflect on? It seems to be either my God or me. What can this mean for Jung? It has always been an important issue in the history of religious thought, how the relationship between God and man can be comprehended, whether this relationship is indeed in opposition or whether man is contained in God in the sense of an all-efficacy of God, including the aspect of unfreedom of man's will. As understood in Hinduism, the Mithraic cult and Christian mysticism this means an essential unity of man with the divine, that man contains the divine, and that man is the creator and inventor of God would become commonly accepted only in modernity, finally leading to Nietzsche's proclamation of the death of God. However, Jung, who was strongly influenced by Nietzsche's Zarathustra, decided in his deep longing and need for a new God to resurrect God, first as a fantasy and imagination, later as a symbol. But then Jung encounters the problem that man always must devote himself to a living God. And were not the old symbols of the divine handed down since ancient times, not images and personifications of real forces that transcend man, be it the forces of nature, of the universe, of the life force itself. When Jung wants to revive the old God images with the magical warmth of your gaze, he must take their power seriously, and he finally succeeds by putting man in front of God and God in front of man without intermixing them. Nonetheless, after opening the egg, Jung feels too much the creator of his God, who then pulls all the power out of him and will leave him feeling empty. This leads to a conflict that Jung cannot really resolve in this passage of his Red Book, with the result that he will descend into hell in the next chapter. The Inner Christ In the chapter Divine Folly, Jung revisits Christianity. Do his experiences and insights regarding the rather remote and foreign image of Sumerian Isdabar also hold in the face of the Christian God image and the face still alive in so many of his contemporaries? In this act of imagination, Jung's eye visits a large library with an atmosphere filled with wounded scholarly vanity and asks for a copy of the book, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. The librarian seems to be surprised and Jung's eye mentions that he is seeking this book not only of scholarly interest, but because it is written from the soul. We haven't come to an end with Christianity by simply putting it aside. It seems to me that there's more to it than we see. And, quote, the divine wants to live with me. My resistance is in vain. I asked my thinking and it said, take as your model one that shows how to live the divine. Our natural model is Christ, 
We fought against Christ, we deposed him, and we seemed to be his conquerors, but he remained in us and mastered us. You can certainly leave Christianity, but it does not leave you, unquote. We should not misunderstand Jung's intention. He is looking for a completely new understanding of Christ. But if I am truly to understand Christ, I must realize how Christ actually lived only his own life and imitated no one. If I thus truly imitate Christ, I do not imitate anyone. I emulate no one, but go my own way, and I will also no longer call myself a Christian. In the chapter Nox Secunda, Jung's eye sits in a kitchen beside a library and shows the cook the book he just borrowed, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis, which the cook also knows, like so many devotional Catholics, and which is used for prayer. She is astonished to see a man like Jung wanting to read it, and Jung spots the following sentences in the book. Quote, the righteous base their intentions more on the mercy of God, which in whatever they undertake, they trust more than their wisdom, unquote. Jung then meditates on the intuitive method of Thomas a. Kempis. When suddenly a roaring sound fills the room, many shadow-like human forms appear, and he hears a manifold babble of voices uttering, quote, let us pray in the temple. We are wandering to Jerusalem to pray at the utmost holy sepulcher, unquote. These shadow-like human forms that suddenly appear to Jung and create a strange desire in him are Anabaptists. Take me with you, he cries, but they cannot because they are the dead, who still have no peace and have not come to a proper end with life. Quote, and what was it that had not been lived, asked one of the dead, greedily and uncannily reaching out for Jung, who then answers, let go, demon. You did not live your animal, unquote. Jung is convinced that Christianity has suppressed the instinctual realm that wants to be acknowledged in life, too. This suppression indeed keeps the dead restless and without peace. The cook gets horrified after Jung's statement, and together with the librarian calls for the police, who take him to the madhouse. Their friendly superintendent, two doctors, and a small fat professor welcome Jung. Quote, Professor, what's that book you've got there? It's Thomas A. Kempis, The Imitation of Christ. Professor, so, a form of religious madness, perfectly clear religious paranoia. You see, my dear, nowadays the imitation of Christ leads to the madhouse. That is hardly to be doubted, Professor. Professor, the man has wit. He is obviously somewhat maniacally aroused. Do you hear voices? You bet. Today it was a huge throng of Anabaptists that swarmed through the kitchen. Professor, now there we have it. Are the voices following you? Oh no, heaven forbid, I summoned them. Professor, ah, uh, this is yet another case that clearly indicates that hallucinations directly call up voices. This belongs in the case history. Would you immediately make a note of that, doctor? With all due respect, Professor, may I say that it is absolutely not abnormal, but much rather the intuitive method. Professor, excellent. The fellow uses neologisms. Well, I suppose we have an adequately clear diagnosis. Anyway, I wish you good recovery and make sure you stay quiet. But Professor, I'm not at all sick. I feel perfectly well. Professor, Look, my dear, you don't have any insights into your illness yet. The prognosis is naturally pretty bad, with at best limited recovery. After these self-critical and ironic statements, Jung remarks, the problem of madness is profound. 
divine madness, a higher form of the irrationality of the life streaming through us, at any rate, a madness that cannot be integrated into present-day society. But how? What if the form of society were integrated into madness? At this point, things grow dark, and there is no end in sight. Jung closes this section with the following remarks. Quote, I leave the spirit of this world which has thought Christ through to the end and step over into that other funny, frightful realm in which I can find Christ again, unquote. In dealing with the imitation of Christ, Jung finds himself on the way to the madhouse, yet as described in Liber Primus, closer to a psychotic episode seems to be his identification with the crucifixion of Christ, in which Salome, his anima, tells him, you are Christ. It seems to Jung that he experiences his own crucifixion in the service of God, or in the service of the rediscovery of God. I stand with outstretched arms like someone crucified, my body taut and horribly entwined by the serpent. You, Salome, say that I am Christ? What does it mean that Salome whispers this to him? Jung should remark later in his famous 1925 seminar, quote, I felt her insinuations as a most evil spell. One is assailed by the fear that perhaps this is madness. Continuing his active imaginations, he writes, quote, It is as if I stood alone on a high mountain with stiff outstretched arms, the serpent squeezes my body in its terrible coils, and blood streams from my body, spilling down the mountainside. Salome bends down to my feet and wraps her black hair round them. She lies thus for a long time. Unquote. This scene reminds us of Christ's crucifixion with Mary Magdalene at his feet. In Jung's active imagination, the blind Salome suddenly cries, I see light! Jung then states, truly, she sees, her eyes are open. The serpent falls from my body and lies languidly on the ground. I stride over it and kneel at the feet of the prophet, whose form shines like a flame. Elijah then says to Jung, quote, your work is fulfilled here. Other things will come. Seek untiringly, and above all, write exactly what you see. In the biblical tradition, Elijah is an important psychopompus since he himself found his own path after a terrifying encounter with God. Here he appears and speaks to Jung's eye. Driven by his interaction with Salome, his anima, the frightening possibility for Jung is a potential inflation caused by how much he leans in his active imagination toward an identification with the figure of the Christ. However, what distinguishes this imagination from psychosis is that it is blind Salome, herself a symbol, who has suggested to him such a state of hubris. What also distinguishes this act of imagination from a real identification with Christ, which often is experienced by psychotics, is its embeddedness in the context of the history of religion, namely the narrative of Jesus' passion, or the imitatio Christi. Moreover, there is the identification with the Godhead in the mysteries of the Mithras, which were well known to Jung and fascinated him. On the same page of Liber Primus, where he imagines the narrative of Jesus' passion, he also experiences himself as an initiate of Mithras. Quote, The serpent has wound itself round my whole body, and my countenance is that of a lion. Unquote. In the cult of Mithras, this corresponds to the deification of the mist. In his seminar of 1925, Jung would critically assess his experiences. Quote, when the images come to you and are not understood, you are in the society of the gods, or, if you will, the lunatic society. 
you are no longer in human society, for you cannot express yourself. Only when you can say, quote, this image is so-and-so, only then do you remain in human society, unquote. Therefore, it is highly important to understand and structure these inner psychic processes. Jung would later integrate his experiences with reference to the Mithraic cult and interpret them within the history of religion. As a result, he avoids identification with the inner figures, yet these deep experiences remained important for him. In this deification mystery, you make yourself into a vessel and are a vessel of creation in which the opposites reconcile. At the time when Jung experienced these active imaginations and put them down in his Red Book, he was undergoing a fundamental process of transformation that made him a vessel, which profoundly changed him as well as his God image. In his later works, Jung would relate the God image to the psychological concept of the self, a concept that was not yet available to him during the time of his Red Book experiences. A New Psychology of Religion with regard to the wholeness of God, Jung ultimately considered all the God images in the history of religion, and through the magical warmth of your gaze, revived them. These ranged from the Sumerian Gilgamesh Isdabar narrative, to the Egyptian sun cult, to the Mediterranean Greek gods, and from there to the late mystery cults, such as the Mithraic cult. In addition, ideas and images from Hinduism were a significant influence on Jung, especially the concept of Atman and Brahman, in which the deep and essential participation of man in the divine, as well as the idea of wholeness, are fundamentally emphasized. Jung dedicated numerous paintings and carvings to the revitalization of old gods, such as for example, Atman Victu in his Red Book. This is Atman Victu, the old one, after he was withdrawn from creation. He has returned to endless history where he took his beginning. The image on page 122 in the Red Book exhibits the other side of the Lapis Philosophorum which is in alchemy the goal of man's lifelong quest. The stone is shown in image 121 as a mandala with an incorruptible diamond in its center. This stone set so beautifully is certainly the lapis philosophorum. It is harder than diamond, but it expands into space through four distinct qualities, namely breadth, height, depth, and time. It is hence invisible, and you can pass through it without noticing it. In his later work, the mandala would become the symbol for psychic wholeness. There are so many images of the divinities that Jung created, despite the biblical prohibition against making icons and images of God. I think, however, that one cannot observe this prohibition by a non-pictorial attitude, but rather by populating the heavens with a plethora of images of the countless aspects of the divine. This would approach the totality of the divine realm, which transcends each single image. Jung, the psychologist, always speaks of the God image, and the symbols of the divine as the only statement we can make with respect to God. However, if he encounters God within his active imaginations, he addresses the God directly, and he then mentions the word God. This accounts for some inconsistencies with respect to the issues of the God image in his Red Book, as well as in his later works, for example, in the answer to Job. Philemon, Jung's wide psychopompus in the Red Book, explained to him the mystery of hospitality receiving the gods who once wandered the earth. Quote, 
But what mystery are you intimating to me with your name, O Philemon? Truly, you are the lover who once took in the gods as they wandered the earth when everyone refused them lodging. Unquote. We remember the classical story of Philemon and Bacchus from Ovid's Metamorphosis, which was also taken up by Goethe in his Faust. There, Philemon is the host of the gods who granted hospitality after they were refused by the rest of the population. As Jung says to Philemon, quote, you are the one who unsuspectingly gave hospitality to the gods. They thanked you by transforming your house into a golden temple while the flood swallowed everyone else. The animal fled to the gods who then revealed themselves to their poor hosts who had given them their last. Thus I saw that the lover survives and that he is the one who unwittingly grants hospitality to the gods." Unquote. If I may venture an image, Jung himself was perhaps the host of the gods. He considered the human soul as the house of the gods, which they would enter and leave. He welcomed them. Vocatus acte non vocatus deus adherit. Quote, summoned or not, the God is present, unquote, is written above the door of his house in Kusnacht. Though he conceives the gods as symbols, he understands that these symbols have a reality of their own and that they are vessels of a reality they transmit. They act as images of the senses for a reality that lies beyond them, which they convey. In the history of religions, there is in Buddhism a development parallel to Jung's encounter with images and symbols in his active imaginations. Although Buddhism itself does not deal with a specific god image, its Tibetan version is a generous host of the old gods handed down from the Ban religion of the Himayan people. The old Tibetan gods are seen as symbols of emotional forces and, being either wrathful or kind, are visualized by the initiate and therefore experienced. For example, there is the compassionate and wisdom-filled energy of the green or white Tara. The process of imagination, as well as of modeling the symbols of divinity in sand or Atanka, is of utmost importance in Tibetan Buddhism. Jung has given us something similar with the method of active imagination and his artistic creation of divine symbols. This can open the way to the cultural memory of mankind by putting the individual into the context of a bigger and more encompassing realm of meaning and thereby healing a spiritual malaise. Without proclaiming a new religion, the Red Book, in a certain sense, is a prophetic book insofar as it brings forth a new view of religious phenomena. Jung considers religious matters by and large in the context of a psychology of religion, a depth psychology of religion, which draws its symbols constantly from the collective unconscious, but at the same time stays in touch with the cultural unconscious of mankind. Jung's view could be highly important for the present day dialogue of religions. It could revive that dialogue if a symbolic view on religious phenomena would be appreciated. Since the mother tongue of religion exists on the symbolic level, whereas spiritual knowledge is alive and draws on experienced images and narratives, rather terminology and dogmatic fixations lose touch with vivid experiences. Lived experiences of the unconscious formed the basis of Jung's Red Book, by which he developed the method of active imagination. Since then, this method has become an integral part of therapeutic work with clients in order to find new paths to spirituality. Together with dreams and work on inner images, this can provide experienced meaning which since ancient times always has been the goal of religion. I've been reading from an essay by Dr. Ingrid Rydell, 
transformation of the God image in Jung's Red Book, Foundations for a New Psychology of Religion. I'll give you a background of Dr. Rydell. Dr. Rydell is a doctor of theology and philosophy, studied theology, literature, and psychology. After a parish vicarage from 1970 to 1984, she became the director of studies at the Evangelisch Akademie Hofgeismar. She then obtained her diploma from the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich and works as a Jungian analyst with a private practice in Konstanz, Germany. She lectures at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich, Kassel University, and Frankfurt University. Various publications on the psychology of religion, as well as on art, creativity, and psychology. So you are prepared to admit that you are a fantasy? Is to bar. If it helps, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> okay, keep in mind now that uh, Dr. Jung is in the middle of an active imagination. And I've talked about active imaginations at great length um, on this YouTube channel. And so I'm not going to go into that right now, but this whole passage is one of the first active imaginations that Dr. Jung did, and it's in an early part of the Red Book. And so, anyway. Okay, reading on. I'm on page 351, if you have the book. Sorry, um, I have been working with the Red Book now for a decade and, um, and through two earlier versions of this book, uh, or volumes of this book. And so sometimes I get quite emotional when I'm reading these things. The inventors of software programs have graciously created things that are get so complicated and so clever that now we can't find anything on our own desktop which is really troubling but anyway okay i can't find it ah <sighs> okay all right so going on I lay there like a child bearer, cruelly, sorry, this is, he's envisioning himself as a woman who's just given birth. The cook gets horrified after Young's statement and together with the librarian calls for the police who take him to the madhouse. There, a friendly superintendent, two doctors and a small fat professor Welcome, Young. Quote. <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes this gets a little bit giggly. So we're at the madhouse. <laughs> um, but Professor, I'm not at all sick. I feel perfectly well. Professor. Look, my dear, you don't have any insights into your illness yet. The prognosis is naturally pretty bad. With a <laughs> sorry. So <laughs> self-abusing. <laughs> 
The prognosis is naturally pretty bad, with at best limited recovery, unquote. In his later works, Jung would relate the God image. Sorry. If I may venture an image, God himself. Now oh, there's a Freudian. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> if I may venture an image, Jung himself. If I may venture an image, Jung himself was perhaps the host of the gods. He considered the human soul as the house of the gods, which they would enter and leave. He welcomed them. Bocatus atque non. He welcomed them. Vocatus acte non vocatus deus adherit. Quote, summon, <clears throat> quote, summoned or not, the God is present. Quote, summoned or not, the God is present, unquote, is is written above the door of his house in Kusnacht. This can provide experience meaning, which since ancient times always has been the goal of religion. Which since ancient times which since ancient times always so obviously you uh, obviously you can see that I'm quite touched by this essay <clears throat> and so I I thank Dr. Rydell for writing it And uh, thank you all for uh, being here and watching. You see my emotional reactions here. <clears throat> but this, <clears throat> and this is where emotion, or I'm sorry, this is where religion has always been on the irrational side of the psyche. And unfortunately, when we make religion too rational by making it all the word, um, we lose access to the actual source of religion. So to the extent that that's useful input for everyone, uh, I appreciate your being here and at least watching it. So I'm going to conclude uh, this session for today and um, I'll be reading one or two more essays in my untutored opinion uh, Dr. Jung found the living God where he lives and how he goes about the work of the Godhead um, and I've created almost 980 videos of about Dr. Young's work, which you can listen to at your leisure. Thank you for being here today. And I will read once again her bona fides. Ingrid Rydell, Doctor of Theology, Doctor of Philosophy, studied theology, literature, and psychology. After a parish vicarage from 1970 to 1984, she became the director of studies at the Evangelische Akademie Hofgeismar. She then obtained her diploma from the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich and works as a Jungian analyst with a private practice in Konstanz, Germany. 
She lectures at C.G. Jung Institute Zurich, Kassel University, and Frankfurt University. Major publications, various publications on the psychology of religion, as well as on art, creativity, and psychology. As I've been reading from Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, Mary Stein and Thomas Arst, Editors, Volume 3, 